Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 30. Python 3.9 is here. This week on the show, former guest and Real Python author Ger Arnahiela returns to talk about his recent article, Python 3.9, cool new features for you to try. Also joining the conversation is Real Python video course instructor and author Christopher Trudeau. Christopher has created a video course that was released this week also based on Ger Arna's article. We talk about time zones, merging dictionaries, the new parser, type hints, and more. Ger Arna and Christopher not only cover the new features, but they also offer advice about ways you might incorporate them into your code. We also discuss what you should think about before updating your code. Okay, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, I want to welcome both of you to the show, Ger Arna. Yes, hi. How's it going? Good, good, good. And Christopher Trudeau, I want to welcome you too. Hey there. All right. We're here to talk about the release of Python 3.9 that came out on Monday. And we're recording this a little bit in advance. There's an article that's up on Real Python, which is by Garana, that's the cool new features in Python 3.9. And so we were going to kind of go through that. But the reason I invited Christopher Trudeau on also is to talk about his video course, which came out on Tuesday, again, recording in the in the future <laughs> past. <laughs> and you guys have some experience working with it, but also kind of diving into what are these new features. And so the big feature, the first one that kind of comes through that I find is kind of a big feature is the proper time zone support or the zone info library. So who wants to start off? Yeah, I could probably jump in. Th- this one is one I'm, I, for some reason, like... Uh, well, I don't like time zones. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like good libraries for working with them. That's something that hasn't been in the standard library. Uh, so you kind of um, had to go to some external library. And I've been using the state util library for a while to work with this. That's a library that's been at least maintained now for the last couple of years by Paul Gensel. And he has been kind of the one that has then brought this into uh, to the standard library. Okay, so it's his, his interpretation in some ways. Uh, I believe so. And my uh, still somewhat limited experience with the Zone Info library is that it, it seems to be essentially very similar to how DateUtil is doing it. But there, there are some of the, say, more advanced features in DateUtil that has not been ported. So the Zone Info is a slightly simpler library, but it still handles, handles time zones uh, fairly properly. And it's quite easy to work with. So it's been quite pleasant to... Yeah, just be able to access time zones with Python. So what were the types of things that were missing? So in the daytime library, some while back, I don't remember exactly when this uh, became available, they they did introduce uh, essentially functionality for handling time zones. So there is functionality for, for converting between time zones. There's functionality for dealing with these weird things that typically happen at the daylight savings when you have hours that disappear or other hours that you kind of repeat twice. But there was no implementation of concrete time zones um, except for UTC time. So if you kind of wanted to have, say, a time zone for um, Central Europe where I'm at or another one from, um, say, East Coast or Central time zones, you would have to actually implement your own time zone object and then spell out the rules for when does the daylight savings thing actually happen and so on, which, of course, is not practical at all to keep track of. Right. My understanding for why they didn't introduce that back when they kind of introduced the functionality is just that they didn't want to have the burden of uh, maintaining the time zones inside the standard library because the standard library changes very slowly, right? It, it's only released once uh, well, once a year going forward, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We could talk a little bit about that too as we go forward too. Yes, exactly. That's another new feature, I guess. So, so that's kind of been the concern mainly that it's better to keep it outside of the standard library so that you can actually maintain it whenever there are changes to the time zone databases. So the solution uh, that is in the zone info is that zone info doesn't actually come with the time zone database itself. 
it just uh, brings functionality for actually reading standard format of, of times on databases. And then at least on Mac and Linux, you'll typically have a times on database installed on your computer that's kind of handle uh, updates via the update mechanism on your computer and so on. So it's kind of more or less kept in, kept up to date. But then they also added a another library that they call a first party library, which uh, I, I don't think I've actually heard that uh, term before. So it's not the third party library, which they usually talk about. Right. So apparently a first party library is something that's not part of the standard library, but it's still maintained by the core Python team. So if you were to install Python yeah. uh, 3.9, it's it's there. Is there an extra step that needs to be done to, to take advantage of it? Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's not there. Uh, it's not part of the standard library. So if you just install Python, you will not have this time zone database uh, package. So that's called TZ data, time zone data. Uh, but the, that is something that you can then install on your computer if if it doesn't find uh, sort of like a system time zone database, which will typically be on Windows um, unless you have installed something there. Okay, so that's something you would do from the Python package index? Right, yeah. And using pip? Yeah, so it's a PyPI package you can install with pip. Could probably then essentially say that on Windows you'll have this extra requirement to install the TZ data if you, if you want to be sure you have it. Okay. Uh, and that would then be a package that is, uh, since it's not part of the standard library, it's something that can be updated whenever necessary, essentially. And my understanding, again, there is that it's just essentially a compiled version of the of the time zone database, the official, is it IANA, time zone database? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, I remember that acronym. I, I can't remember what it spells out. but <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's something slightly weird, right? It's Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Yeah, right. Right. So, so, but yeah, they kind of keep track of uh, important numbers, I guess, for the internet. I guess we'll talk a little bit about it even later with some of the new HTTP codes, which they're also keeping track of. Yeah, okay. If you're wanting to use this new time zone information, is there like an additional import like you would from another standard library module to, to be able to use it? Uh, yes, exactly. So, so it's uh, a new module called Zone Info, uh, and then there is a Zone Info class inside of that module that you just initialize using essentially a text string describing your time zone. So, for instance, it, for me, it would be something like Europe slash Oslo, and then there, there's essentially ma- many of these uh, recognized keys that are, I guess, semi-official at least from the IANA database. Okay. And, and that that database listing is includes historic information as well, right? So, you know, on the Mac, I think it had five hundred and ninety some entries. On Linux, I think it's just over six hundred. Mm. Uh, so it goes far deeper than just the you know twenty five, twenty six around the world that we have. It it includes information that can be calculated from the past, and it kind of centralizes it in a way across different countries. Even though they might be in the same mm. um, time zone, it would have slightly different names for Canada versus, say, you know, places in South America or something. Is that right? Yes. And and that's, uh, and again, that's a historic thing as well, right? So, for example, I'm, I'm out of Toronto in Canada, and there is an America slash Toronto. And technically, we're in the same time zone as America slash New York. But if you go back far enough in time, we weren't, we didn't adjust at the same time they did. Oh, okay. So, like, there's going to be dates where there's a difference, and you know, if you're doing today's date, there's no difference. But if you there's there's times in uh, there's the, there's times in the past where that's changed. Okay. Yeah, because I can think of a couple states that are even like that. I lived in two of them, and I actually enjoyed not ever changing <laughs> for day you know daylight saving. Um, uh, Arizona, which doesn't you know change basically, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting because then it shifts you know your amount of time between the different states, and then Hawaii was the other one, and so. I could see that maybe there was a point in time, which I'm not aware of the history, where that got modified. And I know in the article you kind of go into a particular one of uh, Christmas Island or whatever. Um, I forget the year. Was it 1995 or something? (laughs) Yeah, 94. I guess New Year's Eve, 94. They just skipped the whole day. (laughs) Which is one of these... uh, There's uh, there's some fun videos that are kind of pointing out these all kind of weird things that are happening with time zones, which is, I guess, why you don't want to implement them yourself. And this is probably one of the more craziest ones where they just decided, that, okay, no, we, we don't want to have December 31st, 1994. And the, the reasoning was that they were originally on one side of the international dateline. Uh, so just essentially on the dateline. And they just wanted 
to be on the other side. So then to, to move across, they just skipped one day and then they were suddenly, they moved from being 10 hours, I guess, before UTC to be 14 hours after UTC. Yeah, you don't even have to go that far back. George W. Bush changed it in uh, North America. So they still do daylight savings time, but it shifted, the date that it changed shifted by three weeks, which means uh, Canada and the United States are now out of sync with the rest of the world as to when we switch over. So there's a, I think it's a three week window, uh, late October, early November, where we're minus four in Toronto, and then it switches over to being minus five with the rest of the world, like three weeks later. Yeah. Okay. So it's important to not have to have all that in your head. You don't want to have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. That's a nice addition. So kind of diving to the next one was um, updating dictionaries. What's the, the change with the syntax for updating dictionaries? So there's two new operators that have been introduced, pipe and pipe equals for doing merging and updating of dictionaries. So these are really, they're just shorthands. They're, uh, they're not you're not actually doing anything new with a dictionary that you couldn't do before. Uh, now you can do it uh, fairly succinctly. Okay. You can merge two dictionaries by putting a pipe or or operator between them. So in the article, Garan uh, mentions that there's you know a dictionary with PyCon and another dictionary with EuroPython information in it, and you do PyCon pipe EuroPython, and you get the two dictionaries merged. And then or equals is really just a short form for uh, the update function that uh, already existed. Nice. So it's just kind of re- reusing some some operators in this new context to kind of make the syntax like a little more streamlined. Uh, for the most part, yes. The 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 one big advantage of it, at least with the pipe operator, is this has been implemented in all the dictionary like classes. Some of the short forms that you used to use to merge dictionaries would accidentally turn, say, a default dict into a dict, which you don't want to do. But because default dict is also pipe aware, uh, it's smart enough to know that if I'm merging two default dicts, I get a default dict out of it. Whereas if you'd used a couple of the shorthand mechanisms for doing that before, you could accidentally convert it into a different dictionary type. There's a chance that you might prevent a, a weird edge case bug that you might not have noticed before by doing it this way. Yeah, and you're actually, you'd be like changing the, the functionality of that type, uh, yeah. which is yeah. really going to create a bug that you <laughs> might not have been aware. It's hard to catch type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You'd have to like do a lot of type sort of checking on top of it to, you know, like, okay, is this still a thing? Uh, yeah. It's the kind of thing that tends to pop up, you know, months later. What, why isn't it, why isn't this dictionary ordered anymore? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Cause it's changed. Right. Why doesn't it have a default key? Well, you might not find out until you go to use the default key, you know, later on in the code and not realize why it's disappeared. So yeah, it's the kind of thing that tends to be hard to hunt, hunt down. Do you either you have an example of code where you've needed to merge dictionary stuff that you can kind of think of on top of your head where this would become more useful? I've got the update side. Like you do the up, I, updates very, very frequent. Um, merge isn't as common, I don't find, uh, unless, Garana, you've got something. No, that there's I'm kind of trying to think of it. I, I know there's places where I would kind of have stuff in two dictionaries and need to look it up, but I'm not, I don't have a good example there, I think. That's okay. If I'm dealing with multiple JSON packets coming in off of the web uh, and then I'm needing to, say, store those or change what's in the database if I'm storing the JSON in the database, you're always, when you're dealing with the web uh, features and JSON going back and forth, you're always converting the JSON into dictionaries and dictionaries back into JSON. So anytime you're trying to store those things in the database or update those things from the database, you're you're always playing with dictionaries. Yeah. And so you're, you know, you're, you're adding or modifying the keys that are there. The old surefire way is create yourself a little loop and make sure you've got all the keys going. Well, this is a nice little one-liner that uh, means you don't have to do that. You don't have to do like um, four key value, like, you know. Yeah, exactly. That whole deal. Okay, cool. Which in that case, you'd have to still be careful of the type if you're doing even the loop style comparatively to like. Yes. Other example I think you guys gave was the shorthand um, using unpacking. Is that right? Using the the two stars to sort of unpack the two dictionaries and then yes. combine them. And so, okay. I think there's some other kind of underlying stuff that's there. There's a, a change to, I don't know if these were there before, but there are the Dunder methods for these operators, the Dunder or, 
and the Dunder, is it IOR? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so like most operators in Python, they're actually implemented as functions on the class because everything in Python is a class. So there's an underlying dictionary class that implements uh, double underscore or the word OR and double underscore IOR uh, for the pipe and pipe equals operators. Uh, this allows you to override those and change the behaviors in the classes. I'm trying to think of some other examples where that would be useful. Uh, typically, what this is used for is if you were implementing your own dictionary class or you were updating a class to have dictionary-like behavior, you would be able to implement these functions and have them behave the same way. Alternatively, if you were trying to, you know, uh, you've got a custom default dictionary that you were adding some feature to, you want to make sure that uh, the underlying operators behaves properly as well. So unlike other programming languages where these operator overloaders are done sort of naturally, because these are mapped to functions, you always have uh, control over their behavior. Nice. I guess that moves us on to the next one, which is a a change in uh, decorator syntax, which kind of takes us back to episode one, <laughs> Garona, <laughs> and the subject. Uh, right. And uh, how did how was the response to your talk, your tutorial? How did that go for your PyCon? Ah, right. Since it went online instead, <laughs> we didn't have a chance to follow up on that. <laughs> yes, I haven't heard that much from it, but I got a few people saying that they enjoyed it. So uh, it, it's kind of weird when you just post it online and you don't really get the the, the feedback that you would get in person. But yeah. the, the stuff I have heard has been positive, so that's always fun to, uh, fun to hear, at least. Well, I'll definitely link to it again here so that um, people can check it out. Because it's, it's, I mean, it's literally a tutorial uh, you know, in video form on YouTube. And it's like a couple hours, right? Uh, yeah, so a little bit of context there. It was supposed to be uh, a tutorial on, um, in, at PyCon in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then... The whole thing went on online, so then they kind of offered us to 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 record them as videos instead. So it ended up being about a three-hour video tutorial that's kind of split into at least some sections. Yeah, and tried to kind of keep it fairly practical. So it's kind of spun around. I don't remember now. It was six different use cases that you may want to uh, use decorators for, and then kind of solve so solve those use cases. So it's kind of state the problem and then give you a chance to implement it yourself uh, with some hints and background for what you kind of need to do and then I show a solution afterwards. Nice. Yeah, it's kind of similar to, um, we did another episode with uh, Kimberly Fessel about web scraping and again, uh, like this whole kind of great tutorial. So, and those were something that were going to be a separate sort of charge on top of your PyCon ticket last year. And so it's a really awesome thing and All right. I would definitely encourage people to donate to the PSF if they find it useful because it's a really great resource that you're sharing online mm. with them. Yeah, no, there's been a lot of very nice content at least coming out from even though it had to go on, online, it's still been a lot of nice talks and tutorials there. So yeah. that's at least good. So what's this change to the decorator syntax? Right. So, so to be perfectly honest, I think Actually, putting this one in the in the list of top new features is probably just me liking decorators a bit too much. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> the change is not really that big or not that important. And I think most people will live their whole Python life without really noticing this. But you would define it still as cool. Of course. It, it has to do with decorators. <laughs> no, so, so essentially when they defined uh, decorators back, in Python 2.3 or something like this, they did add a somewhat artificial rule as to what's allowed to use as a decorator. So essentially what you need for a decorator is something that can, a callable that can kind of take in a, a function or some other callable, I guess, in general, and, and return another callable. So you kind of have something that can change one function to a slightly different function is essentially what you end up with, right? then there, there are many ways that you can kind of define callable things in Python, or you can store them in different ways and then pick them up later, for instance, have a dictionary of functions and things like this. But in the decorator syntax, they kind of just decided that the only thing you're allowed to use on the, as a decorator is uh, sort of like a name, possibly dotted, so you can have a method from a, from a class or something could still be a decorator. You could not, for instance, access something inside of a dictionary. So you would not allow to use square brackets. If I remember correctly, this was essentially just Guido saying uh, that he had a gut feeling that 
this would be a, a good limitation to have. In practice, it's usually not something that you run into because most of your decorators will just be a regular function or maybe a, a method on a class or something like this. So it's not usually something that you would think of to, well, I want to run this dictionary as a decorator or stuff like that. But over time, there has been uh, some cases just pointing out, well, why can't I do this? And I think for this one, essentially, it was more of a, you know, not necessarily that this is super useful, we really need this. It was more like, well, this might be useful for the few people who actually need it, and there's no reason not to do it because it's it's an easy fix. Uh, it's essentially just removing a limitation, not really implementing anything new. So it's not going to change the way other people have been using it. Right. So if your decorators work now, they will still work after this change. It kind of just gives you a few more ways that you can directly write decorators. And again, it's not that you're able to do anything that you weren't able to do before, uh, because even in the if, if you had a dictionary full of decorator functions, uh, what you would typically need to do to actually use the decorator would be to just add a temporary variable that kind of refers to your function, and then you can use that variable to decorate with. So it was kind of just one extra line of code that was kind of inelegant, but it would still, it would still work. Uh, so now you can just type it out directly as you would need it. So, so kind of the motivating example that's in the PEP that kind of describes this change is based on a GUI that someone has built with many different buttons and where you kind of need to connect each button to a different callback function. And then one way to just keep track of your buttons would be to collect them in a list or a dictionary or something like this. But then when you actually connect them to to the callbacks, you would need, in well, Python before 3.9, you would need to go through this temporary function or do some other weird, weird hacks to kind of be able to use it from the from the list. But now you can just use the list or the dictionary directly. Nice. Okay. So it's going to save some code writing in that type of example. Right. So, and, and I guess it, it will make the code slightly clearer. What, what, what is it doing, right? It, it kind of means that you don't have to go through that temporary variable that seems somewhat unmotivated. So, Do you have a use that you have been thinking about that you might use for it? Uh, actually, Christopher and I were talking about this. We're kind of, uh, what, what the, essentially, I guess my examples in, in the article are feel a bit far-fetched. And I think that's somewhat illustrative of the use of this. It, it is kind of, I don't have any personal things where I think I, I really want to use this. I kind of, uh, in, in the article, there's an example where you could even, so, so I kind of start out with a dictionary of decorators. And then I just actually ask the user uh, using an input, uh, which decorator do you want to use? And then show that you could even then pick it out from the dictionary dynamically like that how, how that would actually translate to something that's uh, useful in the real world i'm less sure of so this this comes across as something called the signals and slots pattern and it's common in gui and web frameworks and garen sort of mentioned earlier this idea of sort of tying the the functionality of clicking on something or visiting a web page then this function gets called so I suspect that it might help people who are in that exact sort of corner, but I don't think anyone else is ever going to notice it. So if you look at uh, like a web framework like Flask, they use decorators to map your URL that is being hit to the function that's getting called that responds with the content when that URL is being hit. So I could see them doing fancier things with generating those URLs, like maybe you have a dictionary of URLs somewhere, and then you could access those dictionaries by name instead of hard coding things. It gives you just a little bit more flexibility. Mm. But but to his original point, it's a, it's a bit of an edge condition. Okay. So for those people who it affects, they think it's great and everyone else can just sort of ignore it. Yeah. So the next one, I was having this conversation with, with my wife, which is kind of funny that we we're talking Python because she doesn't really use Python a lot, but she helps me a little bit with the podcast. And so she was wondering what we were going to talk about today. And so speaking with her about other episodes and uh, talking about type hints. And so the new annotation sort of subtle changes are, were kind of intriguing to me and I thought it was kind of a good one to in the example that you guys use in both the article and the, the course where you're needing to annotate the units of something 
be, because typical type hints would simply just be displaying, you know, the type, which would, in a lot of cases, like I think you're using a, a sort of a speed example in miles per hour and or p- potential kilometers per hour or whatever. And then in units, you might be speaking in seconds or you might be and so forth. But right. in the end, all those, as far as types, are floats, right? <laughs> so there's not that much information. And so it's kind of a, a subtle change, sort of a historical change of how annotations have been used. And I think it's a little bit of a callback to try to be able to capture some of those uses and give you both. But uh, maybe I'm diving in a little too prematurely to talk about it. So uh, that that's a really the, is really what it comes down to is it it's brought uh, annotations full circle. So their original purpose was meta information on the variables, like you said, things like the units, and then that started to get used for type hints. And now type hints are the most common use of annotations because there's all sorts of compiler tools and IDEs that can use this information to provide you additional tools when you're coding. So we've kind of lost the original purpose of it. So all this change has done is introduced a new class that allows you to annotate with this class. And that class contains both kinds of information. And by codifying that, it means the IDE tools can can continue to look for these kinds of type hints, but you could still get at that meta information. Right. So it, it's a nice little uh, sort of hybrid to uh, to the original purpose, uh, as well as the uh, you know the, the purpose that sort of emerged over usage. So in um, IDE, like I had uh, Savannah on, we recently talked about Pylance. It can take advantage of the type hints in saying that you know, that it's going to be, uh, you know, this is a float. And potentially with this change, it could maybe show both things, could it? Yeah, you know, the reason type hints have sort of taken off is with Python being a dynamically typed language, you can't be warned at compile time of using the incorrect thing, right? So if uh, the variable is meant to be a list and I pass in a float, it isn't until runtime that it's going to fall apart. And this is why us as Python programmers have to be far more vigilant about unit tests because we have to use unit testing to catch these kinds of problems where in a static type language, the compiler catches some of these things. So type hinting is trying to bring some of that feature to the dynamically type language. So now if you are annotating your variable and you say, I'm expecting this to be a list and I'm expecting this to be a list of floats, now your IDE can say, oh, wait a second, it looks like you're passing in a string and that's not going to work and so the ide allows you uh, can warn you about these things and means you don't you can catch them earlier while you're developing is is the general idea behind them without the added step of adding the restriction that static typing puts in so it's a it's a bit of a compromise making python a little more like static languages a little safer like static languages without the removing the flexibility that you get with a dynamic language this is this is one of those things that tends to be sort of religion, right? Like if you, you know, if if you're on a, you know, if you if you're on a, a comment board and someone starts talking about, you know, what why do they hate about Python? It's always well, uh, there's no curly braces and it's it's dynamically typed, right? These kinds of ideas allow us to, as as Python programmers, to be able to take advantage of some of the things that you would be able to do in a static language. The examples that you you gave again, I was saying it was this sort of distance example and. Uh, time and that underlying that, you know, like you may know that this is a, a float, but unless you've named the variable like seconds and you're simply just using like the variable name time, somebody may not, you know, get that idea of units. And so this is kind of adding that additional thing. And then to access it, you have to use a, a Dunder method. Is that right? There are, there are sort of two ways of doing it. Uh, there's a uh, double underscore annotate uh, is available as meta information on the function that you're annotating or on the thing that you're annotating. Okay. There's a method inside of the typing library called get type hints that you can run on things that are annotated and it will return the type hint information and you can pass in an extra parameter which is called include extras. And if you set that to true, then it will give you both the type hint information as well as the meta information that you associated with it. Okay. We had talked about this a little bit before, Garana, about I had created a video course on your type checking article from a little while ago. Yep. And so you have a, a little background on this and, and using tools like MyPy and, and so forth. Are there things that you like about this change? Are there? Um, no, so I guess 
This one is in a sense less about typing and more about just taking annotations back for other purposes. I think that's uh, that that's nice because it kind of then means that uh, you, you don't have to kind of sit there and think for this I want to keep track of the unit so I can't type into my my code now you can actually do both so that's always nice and you and uh, we, we, yeah we've been talking about units um, here the whole time but actually the annotated it just gives you access to add metadata and you kind of it's up to you to define whatever metadata you want to have there and and interpret them uh, so so it doesn't put any any limitations or any real it doesn't either help you i guess interpreting these things it kind of it's up to you to put whatever information you want there and and use it later so like if it, it it's something more complex like a like a dictionary you could have some some other kind of annotations in there to to indicate things that you were sort of expecting to, to yeah. be built inside of here like this is supposed to be a last name or this is supposed to be a you know something something different that way Right. I think uh, another example that probably will, will probably be used would be things like you can say that, okay, this number should be a float, the typing information, but you can also give, it should be a, in, in the range 0 to 100, for instance, and, and those kind of things. And then you could have s some tools or your own code that would kind of enforce that or use that for some kind of testing and those kind of things. Kind of goes back to something that was a theme early on in the podcast where we were talking about the idea of you know libraries and people going onto GitHub, if you will, and and reading actual code, these types of annotations, yeah. in some ways, are intended for people that are going to use your code, <laughs> and more likely, you know, programmers versus like you know, very much just end users. Though I guess that information could be presented, you know, through that too. But someone actually going in and reading the source code really gets even more. Um, not only the intent of the types, but the intent of the other you know, usages there. Is, is that right? Yes, it should kind of be, be much clearer than to see uh, how, how, what, what these things actually are. And, and we show some examples in the article in the course where we just create our own types, essentially. Uh, for instance, we can say that uh, seconds is an alias, I guess, of this annotated type, which is a float as the actual type, but then it has this extra meta information that it's actually seconds. And then you can type in with these new type aliases. So in, in the code, you end up writing something like, okay, distance, colon, feet, time, colon, seconds, and things like this. So it can it can be then very, I guess, easy for, for people you know, using a library later to just figure out what, what are the numbers I should pass in here. For this week's video spotlight, I want to remind you that Christopher Trudeau has created a video course all about this week's topic of cool new features of Python 3.9. In the video course, you learn about accessing and making calculations with time zones, merging and updating dictionaries effectively, using decorators based on expressions, combining type hints and other annotations, and much more, as you can tell from our conversation. I think it'll be a worthy investment of your time. Like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code samples for the examples shown. It also includes a shiny new transcript and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So that kind of moves us into categorically something you guys kind of said, okay, more changes. <laughs> and this one, to me, feels like a, a fairly large change, even though it's under the hood and a lot of people may not notice this. And we've spoke about this before, myself and David Amos, we were talking about the introduction of the PEG parser. So it's one I don't have the full overview of myself yet either, but um, I, I kind of claim that it's both, in a sense, one of the coolest features, and you'll hopefully never notice that it's there. <laughs> right. And what's uh, kind of happening is that in, in the background, when you're running a Python program, the source code is parsed into tokens and these kind of things that are then interpreted further down. And that has from the start been done by something called an LL1 parser, which uh, is a very, uh, I guess, explicitly simple parser. So so it, it's not able to do very advanced stuff. And that has kind of been one of the reasons they used it when they first started Python. They wanted it, the language to kind of be easy to parse because uh, that would both hopefully make the, the actual interpreter easy and it should kind of keep the language easy. 
So the LL1, the, the one number there essentially means that it reads one character at a time uh, without, without actually backtracking. So it kind of needs to be able to read your code and always understand what's happening without ever getting into an ambiguity, which kind of need, would mean that it would go kind of guess wrong what this means and kind of go back again. And that has worked fairly well for Python, uh, but uh, over time, time they kind of realized that it is also a limitation to some of the things that can be implemented in python that there are some things that are not strictly part of what's called an ll1 grammar so something that can be parsed by an ll1 parser uh, so, so they kind of have done some hacks essentially in in the in the parser to kind of get around those things essentially after guido kind of stepped down as a bdfl uh, what's that now, two years ago? He started um, investigating what's called peg parsers. And peg or PEG is short for parsing expression grammar. And this is where I don't really know all the details, but essentially it's, it's, a, it's a more powerful parser than the LL1. So you can avoid some of these hacks that has been made. And it also opens the door for doing some uh, more, I guess, advanced things later where... That's uh, something that has then been implemented now in Python 3.9, but uh, they are not taking advantage of it at all. So there's no features in Python 3.9 taking advantages of this new parser. And that is mainly because they wanted to make sure that they don't break anything. So under the hood in Python 3.9, both the LL1 parser and the peg parser are available. By default, the peg parser is used. But you, you can just add a uh, command line flag, essentially minus x old parser, and it will run on the old parser. So, so if you kind of see some weird behavior, you can kind of uh, use this command line flag to just test if it's an actual problem with the parser. I believe they've done fairly extensive testing of this new parser where they've run it on the whole standard library and most of the, at least, the biggest packages on PyPI and so on. Yeah. And kind of just made sure that the the syntax tree that's kind of created from the parsers are uh, exactly the same. So they have been able to test it like that, which is a really good thing. But there might still be weird corner cases kind of lurking though. But in general, this it should be something that hopefully no one will notice, I guess, for, for 3.9. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, so this is an important time for anybody. It's important that you test your code to to make sure it works in it because that flag, that ability to use the original parser is going to be deprecated. Is that right? Yes. So this is something that's essentially only available in Python 3.9. And then for Python 3.10, they will remove the LL1 parser and it will only have the peg parser. Yeah. Uh, so essentially opening the door then for starting to implement uh, things that are not LL1 into Python 3.10. Okay. So what are some of the things that, that they were thinking? Like, is this something that's in some of the peps as far as that could potentially get implemented with the, the new parser? Yeah, the one that's kind of gotten the most buzz at least, and I think you and David have talked about this a few times, is something they call structural pattern matching, which is kind of like, I guess superficially, it kind of looks a little bit like the switch case statement, but it's much more powerful. It kind of can, can do a lot of cool stuff like uh, assigning variables based on patterns and so on. So it's more like some of the pattern matching capabilities that you'll find in functional languages. So that, that looks really exciting. I think status there is that it's still under discussion, but it seems to have gotten fairly positive buzz. So I'm guessing it will probably show up in Python 3.10, but... We'll, we'll probably know, well, some, sometime in the spring, I guess. Christopher, you said you wanted to go back and talk a little bit more about how the peg parser is working. So if you think about, um, you know, your program is just a text file like any other text file, right? And so the, the parser is a program that reads that text file and does something with it. So it has to read it line by line. And when you're reading something line by line down at the micro level, it's actually reading character by character. So think of a simple um, assignment statement, right? So I've got the variable answer equals 42. So a parser has to pull off the A, the N, the S, and answer. Like it's going along and reading that. And at some point in time, it has to make a decision about what kind of an expression this is. How does it know, is this a comparison or is it an assignment? And with an LL1 parser, 
when you get to the equals sign in answer equals, it can't know if this is an expression or uh, an assignment or a comparison because Python uses equals for assignment and double equals for comparison until it looks at that next character it has no way of knowing so this is in parsing this is called something called look ahead and an ll1 uh, parser has no look ahead in it so they have to do some fancy stuff to sort of backtrack into once it's read the line to to reassess it and decide what it is and you might think that oh okay it only has to look one character ahead when you get complicated expressions you may actually have to look a fair ways ahead. So the, the foundational difference between LL1 and a peg parser is peg parser actually has what's called infinite look ahead. So it is allowed to sort of characterize these things and look at things in groupings. So when you start seeing the difference between the equals and the double equals, it'll know and it'll be able to handle that kind of thing quite succinctly without making the grammar for the language overly complicated. So again, this isn't one of those things that you're you know, myself as a programmer, I, I don't, I, tr I do my best not to think about this in any way or form, right? I don't want to have to think about it. That's why you run the compiler. That's what it's for, right? <laughs> to be diving into those. Yeah. As mentioned earlier, features like PEP 622, you couldn't do them uh, with an LL1 without getting very, very hackish in the underlying code. So this will allow the compiler to be more elegant. Down the road will allow us to introduce new features uh, into the language that otherwise we might not have gotten. So along with the complexity that it potentially can allow for these additional statements where it's looking ahead and and kind of having a better grasp of you know what's going on this whole kind of context is there potentially a speed difference at all do you think um yeah i'm not sure so i think uh, that they are comparable uh, so they've kind of done some tests on this and uh, in some cases the peg parser is faster i think probably is slightly more than uh, well in, in some cases it's a bit slower but it's within 10 20 percent for most time but i think Python 3.9 is the first kind of release for quite a while, which is not significantly faster than the previous release. And I think overall Python 3.9 is actually slightly slower than Python 3.8. Okay. But um, it's essentially comparable to 3.8. And, and I would expect that, so it's t generally, it's easier to optimize code when the code is general. So the more exception cases you have in the parser, the more little hackish things you do, the more little edge cases, the harder it is to optimize the general state because there's always an exception. So by making the compiler easier to maintain, if they decide they want to attack a speed problem, uh, this should make it easier for them to, uh, to do that in the underlying compiler. Yeah, so it's going to be a nice sort of step toward, you know, the future of Python, if you will. Yes. Okay. So the next few are, are kind of small. The... The first one is the sort of string prefix and suffix, which, you know, I did a whole course on, you know, strings and <laughs> and the idea of like, okay, if you want to remove things from the beginning of a string or the end of the string, you can kind of get kind of odd results sometimes. And so prior to Python 3.9, to remove something from the beginning and the end of the string, you really had to do it manually. A common misuse of the strip function was thinking that it was actually pulling a suffix off the end of the string. And that's not actually how strip works. Uh, it, when you give a string to strip, it will peel any of the characters in that string off of the target string rather than the word that you're trying to peel. So if you were going to remove the suffix, you would actually have to find the position of the suffix and then chop the string using slicing or something like that in order to get rid of uh, a suffix and the end of your target string. So Python 3.9 has introduced two new methods in the string library, remove prefix and remove suffix, that all look for the string given in the function in the beginning or end of the target, respectively. And if they're there, peel them off. And if they're not there, don't peel them off. So it's a, a nice, clean little thing without having to think about the structure of the string too much. Yeah, it's not going to dive into the, the rest of the body of the string and potentially remove additional <laughs> characters from the end. Yeah. yeah. To, to be able to do this previously, you would have to have found the substring, checked whether or not the substring was there, and then sliced the substring. So essentially, it's replacing three or four lines of code with a single line, which is usually a good thing. Right. Okay. Uh, Garen, you want to take this one, uh, the type hit generics? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so this one is just kind of cleaning up a little bit how to work with types. One of the kind of weird things when you get started with types is that if you want to type in things like lists or dictionaries or what's in general called generics, which is just uh, usually a, a container that can be parameterized like a list of numbers or a dictionary of a strings mapping to other lists and things like this. To do that, you needed to import, for instance, list with a capital L from typing and, and use that to type into it. And the reason for this was mainly just that uh, the syntax of using lowercase list uh, square brackets didn't really exist and, and it was kind of a little bit complicated to introduce it. So therefore, they just, instead of adding that complication, especially early on when they were using type-ins before, they kind of knew if type-ins was something that would be popular or not. They just created the separate type, which they could kind of play with and experiment with without messing with some of the really important things in Python. And now I think they kind of just come to the place where they're confident that, okay, type-ins are definitely here to stay. It's, it's become an integral part of the language. So now let's actually go back and fix the generic so that you can use the natural syntax of just using using list and dicts with the actual built-ins instead of having to import them from typing. So, so this is kind of just cleaning this one up and, and it will hopefully save a lot of this extra weird import from typing kind of thing that has been needed. Yeah, all the extra imports you'd have to do on each one of them. <laughs> right. And maybe in particular, the just the getting confused as to why do I need a, a lowercase list or a uppercase list here and there and so on. So the, the kind of, I guess, unfortunate thing with this, right, is that, well, we, we still need to be waiting for Python 3.9 to be using it. So not everybody can switch immediately to Python 3.9. So you will kind of have to wait a little bit possibly to, to use this. At the same time, they are uh, deprecating the, the typing uh, capital L list uh, versions of it. So it will disappear, I think, five years after Python 3.9 is released. So in 2025, they will kind of remove the, the list from the typing module. So at some point, you kind of sh should change it up. But that, that kind of, the five years there is not just a random number. It's kind of the, uh, the the length when they support the release anyway. So it's kind of for how long they, they will support the Python 3.9 release. It will still be possible to do it the old way. And this is available in double underscore future as well now if you want to do it in Python 3.7 or 3.8. So you just you would have to import that in for those pieces of code to, to make sure that it stays consistent. Is that right? Yeah. It basically gives you a way of uh, getting ahead of the deprecation as you can import it in. Then you can take advantage of it in uh, earlier releases. Okay. I was going to save this one for Garana, <laughs> the, the topological sort. Do you want to talk about that one too? Sure. I guess th this one, uh, I was talking to David Amos earlier, and I think this would, he, he would love to talk about this probably, because uh, this is right right up his alley. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, essentially, the topological sort is, is just essentially a way to sort, uh, I guess, dependencies in, in a graph uh, or something like this. So if you have different nodes with directed edges on them. So typically one node depends on another node, depends on the third one. So the, the example we use in the article and the course to kind of uh, just make this more hands-on is just uh, the dependencies that you'll have in a package that you want to install from PyPI. So you might have the package you want to install, but this one might depend on other packages. And a topological sort of a graph like this is essentially just finding the order where you have, where you can in this case, then install things so that you always have the dependencies met that you need. And uh, this is kind of, I guess, some of these, uh, well, the more, say, classical uh, algorithm problems and just, okay, write out how, how you do a topological sort. But now it just becomes available in the standard library. Uh, this is also in a in a completely new module, which they, th there was some talk about, okay, we, we wanted to introduce the topological sort, where should we put it? There was, I think the first suggestion was maybe have it in collections module and so on. Uh, but then in the end, they decided that it didn't quite fit any of the modules that are already in the standard library. So they created a new module called graphlib, which for graph library, which I think for now only contains the topological sorting uh, uh, mechanism, but there might be room for new things in the future. Okay. 
So I want to take advantage of the fact that there's a mathematician here. Does this only apply to DAGs or uh, will it to do sorting inside of cyclical graphs as well? What does that acronym stand for? <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, it's a directed acyclical graph. Basically means there's no loops and you can only go one direction inside of it. So the example in the article is uh, technically a DAG. Right. Yeah, no, so to, to have a well-defined topological order or topological sort, you, you need to have no cycles, as you say, and, and directions. So it, it's really only for DAGs. And I th okay. think if you have some cycles, it I don't remember the error if it actually raises an error that tells you there's a cycle, if it's that specific, but it does raise an error if if your dependencies are not, the dependency graph is not acyclical. One thing that, and this we just don't cover in detail really in the in the article, but uh, it it has a it has a, on the one hand a fairly simple API where you kind of just define your dependencies as a nested dictionary essentially, where you list the nodes and then the edges to it. But it's also possible to use it in a more, say, interactive way, where you just start a topological sorter instance, and then you can add the dependencies as you move along. And then once you kind of have built up your graph, you can then start to just chop off the the, the nodes again in, in a correct order. And the reason that they've added this API is that that uh, has some very nice applications in uh, parallel processing of things, for instance, mm. because this can then tell you, okay, now now if you have several processes running and, and you can deal with things in parallel, uh, you can just ask to give, give me everything that's ready to do now, and it will then yield out, say, two or three different nodes, all of them having no dependencies if you start off, and then you can kind of start working on those. And then once the work is done, you can just let the topological sorter say, I'm, I'm now done with this node, what will be the next one? And so on. So, so it uh, has a nice API for also dealing with that slightly more complicated application of topological sorting. This might be really interesting in the data science community and the way that the different types of uh, algorithms that use for like learning and using trees and all those kinds of things. I, I could see that might help some of those libraries. Yes, I believe probably most of them already have implemented something like this, but now there's something that's available out of the box in the standard library, so that would be nice. Okay. So <laughs> I was thinking that it was funny when you're in your video course talking about these next two, Christopher, <laughs> that you said you had a background on having to explain greatest common divisor before. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Uh, the 3.9 is turning into a bit of a, you know, CS Geeks uh, release, right? You've got uh, changes to the compiler, you've got topological sorting, you've got additions to uh, the math library, right? So that there's there's some hardcore math geek stuff inside of here. Greatest common divisor is a function that takes two numbers and returns the number that is the largest number that divides into those two numbers. So for example, the GCD for 49 and 14 is seven. Seven times seven is 49 and seven times two is 14. And seven is the largest number that will go into both 49 and 14. Python 3.9 adds the ability to do this across more than two numbers at a time. So prior to Python 3.9, you used to have to write some extra code or use func tools to sort of chain one of these things together, but you can now do it on multiple numbers. And LCM was not part of the math library before. So LCM and GCD tend to go together. LCM is the least common multiple. So this is in the other direction. So once again, if I've got the LCM of 49 and 14, it is 98. Uh, 98 being the smallest number that 49 will go into twice. And, and 14 times 7 is 98. So the smallest number that both 14 and 49 will go into is 98. Uh, LCM was not part of the math library before, so it's been added in Python 3.9. So now you've got uh, these two functions that tend to go together, uh, both part of the standard library. Yeah, and then I guess that kind of leads into talking a little bit about these new HTTP status codes as another kind of like lower level <laughs> kind of nerdy kind of thing in some ways. In general, I, I'm wondering how, how often these are going to be used. Yes, uh, yeah, I guess this one kind of falls into the same camp as the decorators in that it's probably a niche thing that will not really see much use. But uh, the, there are 
Again, so this Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, the IANA, we talked about with the Time Zones Report, um, they coordinate also the list of official HTTP status codes. And these are the numbers people m might know, right? It would be 404 that you kind of see on your web web page when... Yeah, or 200 would be everything worked great, and then 404 would be... Yeah, not, not found, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, the, these are available in the HTTP uh, module in the standard library, uh, where there is a HTTP status class. So, so you can kind of get at this. And uh, I think that there is an, essentially just have been a couple of new status codes that were defined uh, within the last couple of years. One is 103 early hints, and the other one is 425 too early. That, uh, yeah, I don't really know what they would signify. Essentially, it's something when you have... I guess some asynchronous uh, things happening and you're kind of haven't really gotten an answer back yet or something like this is what it's kind of. The newer versions of HTTP allow the browser to ask for header information ahead of the body rather than getting them together. Mm -hmm. So early hints allows you to request to do this and this will make it look like the web page is loading faster because the browser can start showing things as soon as it gets it. The problem with this is you end up with the possible challenge of what's called a replay attack, which is the browser asking for the same information over and over again as part of the TLS handshake. So they introduced 103 to get this information, and then they introduced 425 for the server to be able to say, no, I'm not going to give it to you yet because you're asking too early. So, But that being said, you know, this is what I do for a living, and I had to look these up, right? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is an edge case. <laughs> So these are like just these kind of communications between your potentially your own Python app in this case and the browser. Yeah, I would expect the biggest change is going to be you know, you're going to find this using this inside of things like the request library when you're when you're writing code uh, to take advantage of the server providing these headers sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there was kind of a silly one in there too, right? <laughs> what is that one? Yeah, so, so there's also the third error code that's added, which is 418, uh, I'm a teapot. And uh, <laughs> this is kind of an old joke that has somehow kind of festered. So back in uh, 1998, I believe it was, on, uh, there was an April Fool's joke where the hypertext coffee pot control protocol, the HTCPCP, uh, was introduced. And... Um, this was uh, then written up as a proper RFC, I guess they call it, a request for comments. So sort of like an official document um, describing this new protocol that would then help you control, monitor, and diagnose coffee pots. It kind of is made to look more or less like HTTP, and it kind of uses methods like HTTP does, codes, uh, similar status codes. Uh, but then it also introduced this new status code 418, I'm a teapot, which would then kind of make sure that people didn't start brewing coffee inside of a good teapot. And this is, of course, just a big joke, so it's never been a part of the HTTP status codes, uh, but it has somehow been lingering around. It has been implemented then by several libraries. Uh, there was then an in initiative from, I believe this would then be IANA, to, to remove this 418 before it kind of ended up everywhere <laughs> but then it was of course a big debate about this and uh, somebody started a save for 18 uh, web page so you could kind of uh, which then ended up with them uh, i think it's not uh, 418 is still not an official http status code but the number has kind of been proposed to be a reserved status code that will not be taken by other things so that it, it's more okay to now implement 418 in different libraries. So so it's been in requests for many years, but now it's then also included in the HTTP standard library. I guess that kind of takes us to uh, sort of a bit of a wrap-up section where we can kind of talk about, you know, what are the use cases you have for upgrading or timeframes? Christopher, do you, what's your plan as far as Python 3.9? I tend to upgrade the compiler itself as quickly as I can, as soon as it's out um, for any of the projects that I'm working on personally that I don't have any dependencies on. I tend to move to the latest and greatest immediately, but that's more of a habit than anything else. Okay. That being said, due to backward compatibility issues, so for example, in the open source libraries that I maintain, I'm not going to be introducing any of the features here that aren't future-proof for quite some time. 
because 3.6 is still supported and still out in the wild. If I start adding, you know, pipe operators in for my dictionaries everywhere, that's going to break code for people. I've had folks on the internet give me a hard time for using F strings in some of my libraries because, you know, they're not there in all versions. And uh, so you have to sort of understand how this is going to impact the people that you're working with and the people who are using your code before you can make a decision about how to make those kinds of changes. But for my own projects or things where I'm in control of the server, I tend to upgrade early. For things like libraries and stuff like that, I will uh, I'll I'll upgrade my test suites, but I won't make the language changes until things are a little more established. So, so for example, you know the the annotated hints you can get that at a future, so you can use it. Uh, pipe and pipe equals for dictionaries. If other people are using your code, you might want to wait a little bit. Yeah, and Garana? Uh Yeah, yeah, much the same story. I tend to update uh, my. my Kind of the, the yeah the interpreter I'm running as soon as I can just because it's I guess fun and easy to uh, to upgrade early instead of getting uh, stuff stuck behind. But for for the libraries I do as Christopher does is essentially make sure it works at least back to three six, uh, which seems to be what has kind of been the I guess de facto uh, lowest version that has been supported for a couple of years now because. Uh, the F strings got so popular that a lot of libraries kind of moved on to them quite early. Yeah. I think for Python 3.5 was just the, the latest kind of version that uh, will be released, was just released. Uh, so it's now unsupported Python 3.5. So now Python 3.6 is the, the oldest Python that is officially supported. So I think uh, for, for libraries, it makes sense to still write 3.6 compatible code. It, it's kind of nice that the most of the things that are, yeah, the, the dictionaries and the, I guess the remove prefix are probably some of the features that will not be easy to to use in older code. While uh, the time zone support that we talked about, which I think is probably the one that I personally will have the most use for, is available uh, as a so-called backport. Uh, so while it's not installed with my Python 3.7 or 3.8, uh, I can pip install a package called backport.zoneinfo. So I can use it from there. Uh, and that's completely compatible with the zone info module in 3.9. So, so that kind of allows me to start using the time zones al- already now, wherever I want to, essentially. Nice. So I think essentially that the question of upgrading is is a little bit just which, which context are we upgrading in, right? So if it's um, just for stuff you're running on your own, then it's usually okay to start upgrading fairly early. While if it's libraries other people depend on, it's nice to to stay backwards compatible for a while longer at least. Yeah, that makes sense. I know we talked about it briefly, but if you were going to compare this release with previous releases, how would how would you compare it, say, with the changes that came in? Because you've been writing articles on this uh, this is like your third year of doing this? Yes. So th- I guess it maybe it's longer um, because of the the cadence changed too, right? right? Yeah, I guess we haven't talked too much about that. But this is my third new features in Python article, yeah. um, which kind of started somewhat randomly. So that would be two, yeah, more two two and a half years ago. Then I guess for Python three seven. Um, at that point, I was a fairly new author with Real Python. Dan just uh, posted a question: Does anybody just want to write an article for the new upcoming Python 3.7, which will be released in three weeks, I believe, if I remember correctly? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> and uh, at that point, I, I had uh, investigated a little bit to the data classes uh, that were, I guess, the headline change in Python 3.7. I had written an article about it, so so I was kind of a little bit in the mood for it already. So I kind of jumped on that one and and fairly quickly was able to write the article and we were able to publish that on the same day as the release of Python 3.7. So then last year when Python 3.8 was released, I was kind of thinking it it would be fun to try to do the the same for Python 3.8. And we managed to do it again. There I kind of ended up um, having to harass some of my co-authors and reviewers because again, it was kind of done a little bit uh, towards the end. So we kind of had gotten some experience with working with the new features in 3.8, so especially the walrus operator, which I guess was the big big thing there. And then they actually changed the release 
update of uh, Python 3.8 uh, fairly shortly before the actual release, uh, a week or two or something like this, where it was moved forward, or at least I didn't notice until I think a week before that they had changed it. So so it was released one week early. We, we kind of have this big process at Real Python, right, where we review the article in several stages. And uh, we ended up having to... Uh, yeah, and I was kind of handing in my article to the for technical review with uh, Jim, who I guess was on an earlier episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. And while I was sleeping, he was awake over in, in the US <laughs> and, and can kind of do the technical review. So when I woke up, I had the article and I could kind of uh, do the updates. And uh, and then when he woke up, he, he could review my up- updates and we could kind of send them over to Joanna, who does the didactic review and so on. So it kind of got everything together and I think somehow managed to publish this one also on the day it was published. So this year, I guess with some experience now, we managed to at least have it a few weeks early, uh, the article ready, and then um, now also then coordinate with Christopher so he could do the do the video course together with it, which... Yeah, that's actually worked out really good and having a little bit of leeway and, mm. you know, as long as everything goes smoothly here, <laughs> right? <laughs> it should have come out on the, t- the Tuesday before this. So, yeah. you know, it all looks good. Right. So, but yeah, back to the actual question, I guess, was uh, how, how does this compare to the previous releases? And I think if, if you go back to also include Python 3.6, I think what kind of ended up being probably the, the, the feature for Python 3.6 were the F-strings. Yeah. Which kind of moved a lot of projects to only support 3.6 plus, right? It's, it's become very popular and it's been a long time since I wrote formatted strings the, the old fashioned way in a sense. I really enjoy those. For Python 3.7, I think data classes was probably the big change there. Um, and those were also this kind of nice change that you could use a backport for. So it was easy to introduce to your to your projects. Python 3.8, definitely the one that got the most buzz was this uh, walrus operator or the assignment expression. I guess partly because of the fallout of the whole discussion around whether to introduce it or not as well, since that was kind of what ended up uh, with Guido uh, stepping down as the BDFL. But the feature itself is also changing the language a little bit. It, it's I think now that I've gotten to use it a, a little bit, the walrus operator is one of these things that just gives you a lot of small wins. Uh, so there are small little places where it kind of improves your code a little bit without making a big change. And in that sense, I guess it's somewhat similar to F-strings, right? It's it's small wins all over the place that kind of adds up uh, over time. Yeah, so this one's kind of in a lot of other just kind of smaller smaller wins. But, you know, again, underneath it, the pick parser probably would be the, the big one, right? Yeah, I guess the lasting legacy of 3.9 will probably be the peg parser. But for 3.9, we don't really see the effect of it, right? So I think in my mind, uh, for people who need it, I guess getting time zone support into the library is probably nice. So that's probably the one that I'll pr- personally use the most. And that that's an easy thing to introduce because of the backport. And then I think uh, the... Um, the the updating of dictionaries and the the remove uh, prefix and suffix methods are probably the ones that will see the most use um, when it kind of becomes more yeah more available. All those those you kind of need to wait for having full support for three nine to to really use since it's a syntax change essentially. Yeah, cool. One of the big changes you know coming up already. Uh, we're not moving to a, a Python version four right away. It's already in process. This is something I talked with Wukash Longa very early on in the podcast history. Here, uh, he's the release manager of Python 3.9. And he was telling me at the time that you know they were already working on Python 3.10. He wasn't sure who was going to be the release manager of that. And he thought he was going to be himself. But now there is a new person who's going to be handling that, which is probably good. Take a little uh, load off, off of him after doing 3.8, 3.9. But so now version 3.10, 3.10 is going to come out. And that can cause some potential issues. I had a similar problem with Apple's operating system and this uh, this installer called Brew. You know, when the numbers went from 10.9 to 10.10 to 10.11, the this simple syntax of saying like greater than 
uh, or less than as far as like, you know, pinning the, the versions that this brew install could work with sort of broke. And so I think that may happen in some Python code. Is that right? what you were thinking, Christopher? Yeah, that, that's just something you need to be aware of. So that there's sort of two ways of describing a version like this inside of your code, the good way and the bad way. <laughs> uh, and the bad way is uh, with strings, right? So I've got a string that has 3.9 inside of it, and I've got a string that has 3.10 inside of it. And because of the way ASCII works, 3.9 is greater than 3.10 as strings. So if you are trying to do that comparison, you're going to get the wrong answer. What worked for 3.8 versus 3.9 will not work for 3.9 and 3.10. So the sys library, when you ask it for a version, it doesn't return a string. It actually returns a tuple. And tuple comparison does work properly. So you get a tuple with 3,9 in it and another tuple with 3,10 in it. So if you've, you know, if you've been a good little boy or girl and you've been using the <laughs> sys library the way you're supposed to, then you won't have this problem. But if you've got some hard-coded version strings in there, you can you can run into a bit of a challenge. But Flake, uh, Flake 8 has been updated to check explicitly for this difficulty. So if you're using uh, you know, a linter like Flake 8, uh, it'll help you catch these kinds of little corner cases. Hmm. Yeah. So Christopher, I have these weekly questions that I ask everybody. What's something that you're excited about in Python right now? And again, it doesn't have to be specifically about Python 3.9. It could be a package or an event or a book or what have you. So what's something you're excited about? So I've just started uh, Anthony Shaw's CPython internals. I've got a background in other programming languages, but for Python, for me, I've always come at it from programming with Python rather than, you know, how how it works underneath the covers. So the chance to sort of break the spine on this and uh, look at how the pieces fit together and maybe uh, go back to my computer engineering roots and understand how these more complicated systems work. Uh, it'll be a nice little refresher to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to to digging into that. Yeah, nice. Uh, Garon, what, what are you excited about right now? I think I'll uh, uh, mention uh, a library called Panel, which is a dashboarding library. Uh, so somewhat similar to Dash, uh, that's kind of built, built on top of Plotly. Panel uh, is it's definitely similar. It can, kind of shows the same use cases. And I have been using it now for a project at work for a while where I'm building a somewhat complicated dashboard. And it's kind of been an interesting learning curve. But one thing that I kind of missed when I was building this complicated dashboard is that it's super nice for kind of doing prototyping dashboard similar to what you can do in a IPython widgets or Jupyter widgets kind of thing uh, with a Jupyter notebook where you can just uh, essentially give uh, give the panel uh, just some data and it will kind of just build a dashboard from it and then you can start uh, start playing with, with your data immediately. Um, but then um, then you can kind of start from this prototype and then uh, gradually built it into a more professional looking dashboard it's been uh, it's been really fun to, to discovering s- some of these features and the the community around this panel library is is really nice the, the, it's still under very active develop, development and the the people working on it are super responsive whenever i've had any questions to it so i've really enjoyed playing with that one and it, it's kind of part of this bigger set of packages called PyWiz, uh, so as in Py Visualization, uh, where there's also thing, packages called HoloVis and uh, HVPlot and uh, Geo uh, GeoViews, HoloViews. Uh, yeah, so, so several of those that are kind of packaged together. So so it's it's a really nice way, way of working together with different visualization tools. Oh, that sounds great. Christopher, what are you, what are you interested in, in learning next? So the stuff I'm working on right now is all web stuff. And uh, the next project up is probably going to be a desktop application. And it's probably going to be in the data space. So I'm not 100% sure that's what's happening yet, but uh, that's what it's looking like. As a result of that, I'm going to have to dig into some sort of GUI stuff, probably PyQt. And I'm definitely going to have to be digging into probably pandas and likely NumPy as well and sort of using all those things together. So I've got... uh, um, a, a big, there's a big to-do list uh, lurking <laughs> in the back of my mind. Yeah. And Garano, what are you looking at learning next? So my background for, from the last couple of years, I've been working with the, in the Norwegian Mapping Authority before I changed jobs uh, last year. And uh, I got to do a little bit of, uh, say, GIS uh, tools or ge- geographical calculations there. Uh, but now I have a couple of projects coming up at work where we'll 
really be diving into even even more details about this. So, so these are things I find really fun to play with, and and, uh, and now I have projects where I can really go go in depth on them. So that uh, that seems really exciting. Okay, cool. Hey, I really want to thank you for taking all this time to to break down you know, not only your article, Garana, and the video course, Christopher. Thanks again for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's been a, it's been a blast. Great. Thank you very much. I want to thank Christopher and Garana for joining me this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.